Now, <clears throat> I, I, I make a living by testing kids. I'm a clinical neuropsychologist, and I, and I test kids if there's concern about their attention or their learning or their social life or their anxiety. And, and I've been up now for 35 years, and I never get tired of it. I just, I just love the way kids think. And, and I see a lot of kids these days with autism, and I, I really I love the way they think. A couple, within a year, a couple years ago, within a couple of months, I saw two kids, two teenagers, who are, I'm, I'm sitting, they're sitting across the desk from me. And they look over and they see a picture of me in a tuxedo and my daughter in a wedding gown. They say, well, you got married? <laughs> I said, yeah, 40 years ago I did. That's, that's, that's me at my daughter's wedding. And both these boys said, with just disgust in their voice, you married your daughter? <laughs> 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 so, so Ned and I have been, have been friends for seven, eight years. And uh, we wrote this book primarily due to two concerns. And the first is what many of you know is this kind of unprecedented level of anxiety and stress, depression and stress-related mental health problems in teenagers and young adults. And you know, there, there's a woman in San Diego State who did, did this very interesting study using um, a psychology instrument that was actually developed in the 1930s. And an adolescent version was developed in the 1950s. And she found that, that young people in the early 2000s were five to eight times more likely to report the symptoms of anxiety disorder and depression than young people were at the height of the Great Depression or during World War II or during the Vietnam War. And just last year, this, this same scientist who studies generational differences, how, how Generation X trans, transforms into millennials, and she wrote an article saying, that my whole career, I, I, you have to look so carefully to, to track these generational differences. They happen glacially. She said, I've never seen anything like what's happened in the last five years, since 2012, so that, that uh, in, in the spike of anxiety and depression in young people. And she said that, that, that they're, they're connected with each other electronically all the time, but they've never been more anxious and lonely and unhappy. And Ned and I see this in our practice. It's, it's rare for me to see a kid, in, not that, I, I'd say at least half the kids I see have been diagnosed with an anxiety disorder. There's a lot of depressed kids. And these are stress-related problems. And, and so we're concerned about, about this piece. And we, we're, I was, we were lecturing about this a couple weeks ago. And somebody says, does it get better when they go to college and they have more control over their life? It, it gets worse in college. The, the, the mental health crisis in college is just off the charts. Even, I think in 2014, Yale reported that 50% that of their undergraduates seek mental health uh, services, and 30% of those have serious suicidal ideation. And, and so it, it's, it's not a pretty picture, and this was one of our main concerns. And the second is, is that we, we see a lot of kids who have what we consider to be, we call it disordered motivation, where kids who are obsessively driven, you know, Harvard or my, my life has no meaning kind of, kind of thing, where they're chronically anxious, chronically tired, chronically obsessed with achieving. And I see so many kids who are not good students and figure, what's the point of trying? And, and so both this, this, what we consider to be kind of unhealthy motivation or unproductive motivational patterns. And it, it, it occurred to us that, that the thing that connects these two things is a sense of control. And that's what our book's about. It's about how important it is for young people to have a sense of control over their, their lives. And we, we, we knew, there's a woman in Montreal, a scientist in Montreal, who said, you can summarize what makes life stressful with the acronym NUTS. Novelty, and the idea is that stress makes you nuts. That's the idea. <laughs> Novelty, unpredictability, potential threat, and a low sense of control. And most of the stress scientists think it's this low sense of control that's the most stressful thing in the universe. And anxiety, depression, are, are, they're, they're, they're stress disorders. They're disorders of the stress response, where, where, where genes that are supposed to turn off the stress response can't stay turned on. And so just kids have high levels of stress hormones and, and are more, become more emotionally reactive, more, more increasingly anxious. And so we figured that if a sense of control is really highly related to your ability to manage stress and to tolerate stressful situations, it must be a really big deal. And we also figured that every place we looked in terms of how do, how do young people become self-motivated, uh, that every, everywhere we looked, the arrows pointed in the direction of, <coughs> of autonomy 
You, to, for, to become self-motivated, you have to have a sense that this is my life. And I get to, I get to, to make decisions about it. I, I get to figure out how to, how, to, what, what, how to, I get to learn from my mistakes. And so we thought, so much of what we do is trying to minimize the extent to which kids are plagued by stress-related problems and trying to help kids develop these healthy motivational patterns where they're pursuing, they're, they're, they're pursuing their life with passion. They're trying to develop themselves. They're trying to develop themselves so they have something useful to offer this world as, as opposed to being obsessively driven or doing as little as possible. And we figured this must be, be a really big deal. And so we wrote this book that's really kind of a how-to uh, manual. And so, and so the sense of control, it's not control itself. The idea, if you have a high sense of control, it doesn't mean I get to control everything. I'm the boss of my family. Or I'm, supposed to, I'm supposed to be able to control everything. It just means that I, I have a sense that I can direct my life. I'm not helpless. I'm not hopeless. I'm not passive. I'm not resigned. That's one piece. It's a sense of agency or autonomy. The other aspect of it is, is basically the brain state when, that, that exists when you're in your right mind. When you're pursuing goals, you're working on something, you're, you're, you're in the moment, you're, 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 <coughs> you're working hard, but you aren't overly stressed. And what happens when you're in that kind of brain state is that the prefrontal cortex, the part of your brain that, that does the executive functions, that can put things in context and can inhibit and can use judgment, regulates the rest of your brain, including the amygdala, the very prim primitive part of your brain that senses and reacts to threat. And we, we know that kids who are resilient, and adults who are resilient, meaning they bounce back quickly, they, ha they handle stressful things well. They have stronger connections between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala than most people do. And so we wrote this book with, with the idea of how do we help kids develop the sense of autonomy or agency, and how do we help them stay in a brain state that, that, that allows them to develop this, these strong connections between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala so they can be in their right minds most of the time. And the concern is that if a young person gets depressed or develops an anxiety disorder, it changes the brain in a way that makes them just more vulnerable to, getting, to being anxious again or getting depressed again. And the, the, the neuroscientists say that teenagers are sculpting their adult brain. And what we, we, what we figure is that the most important, at least from our value, the most important outcome of adolescence, it's not where you go to college. It's having a healthy brain. And we want kids to, to be as successful as they want to be. But we want them to be able to enjoy their success. And we see so many people, and we, we see a lot of very wealthy and successful people in, in, in Washington, D.C., who are friggin' miserable and who are, is, have everything they could want except for peace and happiness. And we want kids to be sculpting brains that know how to be happy, that know how to be, work hard, but know how to enjoy the, the success. So we wrote this book about how to help kids develop this healthy sense of control. And the cool thing about the, the research on, on this idea of a <coughs> sense of control is that it's not only is it valuable in, in um, helping kids develop resiliency and really shielding them against the stressors that are, frankly, part of life, um, and also, it, it not, also it's valuable for, um, for developing intrinsic motivation. This idea of a healthy sense of control is also remarkably valuable for performance. So I'm a test prep geek. For, for 25 years, I've helped people prepare for you know, nasty little tests like the SAT and ACT and all those other four-letter words. Um, uh, and, and I had the experience of, you know, for years and years, you know, particularly when I was young, I'd work with a student who was, you know, really bright and really capable and supported by mom or dad. And this kid would you'd take practice tests and everything was going great. And then we'd go to the day of the test and things went a little sideways. And then a few weeks later, I'd get a call from an unhappy mom saying, I mean, what's going on here and what happened? I was 23 when I started doing this. I didn't, I didn't know anything. I don't know what happened. So, so the kid would come in and we'd sit there and talk about it. What was, how was the math? Was the vocabulary anything weird? The proctor script at the time? No, no, no. And, and almost invariably, it ended up with something like, I just don't know. I don't know. I mean, the test, just, it just it seems so much harder than the ones we did for practice. Now, the thing about standardized tests they have very few things going for them, in my view. Um, but typically, one of the, the few advantages of standardized tests is that they're, I mean, well, they're, they're standardized, right? So, so this idea that, that this test that the kid took was so much more difficult than the one that we had just from last year that she did for practice, that kind of didn't make any sense. So if it's not the test that's changing, we need to be thinking, what else could be changing? And, and partly, partly it's the circumstance, but also it's the brain state of the person taking a test 
more pressure versus less pressure, right? So these students kept giving me a hard time about this, and so I finally decided I'd be sort of the Marlon Perkins of test prep. That's a reference for people who are old like I am. Uh, and I'd go out and actually take this test and, 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 and see, doggone it, what's just going on with the silly SAT thing? So there I was, age 28, sitting, you know, in one of those little desks, you know, like all your high school students with a bunch of other teenagers. Um, yeah, it, it, it was as awkward as you'd think it would be. Uh, and, so, and, and I'm sort of, you know, eavesdropping on them and wondering what's going through their heads? And like, how nervous are they? Like, really, what's up? And for no particular reason, I check my own pulse. So 140 beats a minute seemed a little high, <laughs> particularly because I have very few skills. But one of them is I'm really good at these ridiculous tests. Oh, and in terms of pressure, I mean, apart from old guy in the room, and that's odd, but I get that. It's even weirder now at my age, you can just imagine. Um, but I also didn't need this test for college admissions. I was not going back. I checked my alma mater, they don't, you're done, we're done with you. So it's like, what's the deal? Well, somewhere along the line, someone introduced me, uh, introduced to me a performance curve, and we talk about this in our book, that basically looks at the benefit to a point, and then the detriment, increasingly, of stress and what it does to performance. So if you can think of a, you know, a, a, a bell curve like this, right, when there's no stress, there's no, no you know, there, nothing gets done, right? You know, on a snow day, try to get your kid to do homework. Good luck with that, right? If you play sports, I have a lot of students who are really athletic, I said, if you play me in, you know, soccer or, you know, tennis or golf or football, pick pretty much any sport, your kid's gonna win because I'm just not very athletic. But your kid's not going to look at his or her best because I'm not good enough to make her be on her toes, right? It's when your, student, when your sons and daughters play against people who are just as good as they are. Ideally, you know, the rival school, so they're really good, but they really, really don't like them. So they've got some motivation, and, the, and that certain amount of stress puts them in a place of kind of peak performance. The problem is, as the pressure keeps getting higher, the performance doesn't go up, it comes down. And so a huge amount of the work that I do, I think of myself as kind of a test prep therapist, right? I have all these kids who are already going down the curve from peak performance, and this test feels really important. And a lot of times parents start you know, pushing them. They don't you understand how important this is? Which just moves the pressure up, and it doesn't increase performance, it decreases performance. So I spend a lot of time with my natural size and strength sort of boxing out parents and giving kids a space where it's okay if we don't do well for now, right? We need to get you to where you want to be, but if we can make the pressure feel 10% or 15 or 20% less intense, we go back up to that curve of a place of optimal performance. One of the things we do care a lot about um, beyond tests like the SAT and, and performance is this idea of motivation, right? We want our kids to be intrinsically motivated, right? They, we want, and I, in a perfect world, kids do things for what's called an internal locus of control rather than external locus of control. We want students to engage in things that are meaningful to them and they're not doing it only to get a grade. Right? That's a pretty dreary existence for, for four years of high school. So one of the models of motivation that we, we really lean on heavily in our book is what's called self-determination theory and it's probably one of the best supported uh, uh, theories in psychology. And it's a model, again, of intrinsic motivation, of people wanting to work hard at something, even if it's really hard, because they want to be successful at this. It's not fear-based, it's internally based. And the model holds that there are really only three things we need. It's a very elegant model. To be intrinsically motivated, you need a sense of competency. Again, if you play tennis the way that I do, you can barely, you're not too motivated to do this. So you need to be good enough. Not the best, but you just have to be good enough. You need a sense of relatedness. So the first hour that I have with pretty much any student trying to understand who or she is as a, as a, as a learner, questions like, so, so you know, what do you do outside of school? What's your favorite class? And, and kids will say something like, oh, I love math. And so the follow-up question is, so is that the, we're great. I love that you love math. Is that the class or is that the teacher? And as you all know and can anticipate, more than half the time students will say, Oh, it's the teacher. I mean, I never really liked math this year, but, but Ms. Sanchez, she's great. And I know, it just, it's so much cooler. Because that relatedness piece is really, really important. Actually, a great piece of advice, uh, when your kids go to college for the first year, they should choose the, teacher, the professors who are most popular. Don't even worry too much about what they study. Cho choose the best professor, because that relatedness will get them out of their dorm rooms, out of their beds, and actually going to class, which is you know, a good place to start for, for, for being a successful learner. Um, <coughs> And the third piece is autonomy. It's really hard to work hard at things where you feel like you have no say. 
Like your choices don't make a difference. You're just, you're just a, you know, part of this, the, along for the ride and you have nothing to say about it. And so we, were, uh, we put a call into Edward Deasy, who's one of the guys who, who established this theory. And we asked him, he said, it's our perspective that of the three of these, competency, relatedness, and autonomy, that it's really the autonomy, that's the one that to us feels like it's the most important. Is that, is that what your research shows? And he said, absolutely. If you're gonna push on something, push on that autonomy piece. Now, I don't know your school this well, your, your community that well, but I'll tell you back in DC, it doesn't feel like those things are in balance. I have all these parents who, it's push, push, push the competency piece, right? I mean, your kid's in second grade and she's not on a travel soccer team? What are you people doing? She's never gonna get a college scholarship. You better get her some private coaching, right? I got a parent who called up the other day and was asking about math tutoring for, her, for their daughter. And said, so, well, I mean, her older brother's really into math. He's really good. He's on the advanced math track. And that's a big part of his academic success. And we think that's what's really going to get him into college. And we really like her to be doing that math too, though. She doesn't like it as much. But she feels like she needs some support. So we've been doing this Kumon for several years now. And we think maybe time, now it's time to do one-on-one -on -one tutoring. And, and with this question for her, I mean, I'm trying not to make this a big deal. And I don't want to be overly stressed about this, really. But does it seem like just three days, just is three days a, a week of math uh, too much for, 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 for our daughter to do? Because she's in fourth grade. Um, so it's not a multiple choice, it's a true false. The sh short answer is, yeah, three days is way too much, right? Think about that for a, what, 10-year-old? Competency, relatedness, and autonomy. Oh, push, 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 push on that competency piece. But the relatedness, psh, gone all right the window. Mom, mom has gone from mom to like a crazy person, right? You know, and, th and that autonomy can't be, be too high. I mean, I just can't imagine there are too many 10-year-olds like, Mom, that whole, you know, free play after school that the research says is so good. I just, I think it's a bad idea. I really, you know, spending time with my friends, I just don't know. I mean, because now that I'm 10, I really should be getting tutoring. Said no child ever, right? <laughs> So this autonomy piece is really important. Um, the other models, and, and really this, this idea of a sense of control, for us it's really, really went through every single successful model of motivation. I'm sure everyone knows the great work of Carol Dweck and mindsets. What is a growth mindset but the idea of a sense of control? What is a fixed mindset but a lack of a sense of control? You're naturally good at this or not, well, <laughs> good luck, congrats, or you're screwed versus a growth mindset. Oh, this math is so hard. For now, I bet if we got you the right person or I bet if we approached a different way. When I have kids who aren't good at math, I say, I have no doubt there is nothing in math that you can't learn. It's simply a matter of how much time and effort and whether this amount of time and effort is worth it. If it doesn't matter to you, we'll just move on and we don't worry about it. But it's not a judgment of you. If you want to, if you want to put in that much effort, it's up to you. You have the control to advance your mathematical knowledge and ability if it's something that matters to you. And then the last model that we look at is what's called flow state. And so flow is a, is a brain state when people are working really hard at things. It's, it's high challenge, it's low threat. It's rarely, well, sometimes it can pop up in school, but a lot of times in school, kids do just what's necessary to earn the grade and then they move on. The great researcher Reed Larson talks about the, the, really the best way to get in a, in a flow state is what he describes as the passionate pursuit of pastimes. When kids are really digging into to art or, or, or coding or theater or, or music or dance or rock climbing and they're, and they're pushing themselves really to the limit, it's high challenge, it's full intense engagement, but it's low threat. Actually, Bill, you have a really fun story about, uh, about your flow experience in oh, high school. Oh, yeah, yeah. Share yeah. that? So, yeah, sure. Um, when I read about this research of, of, of Reed Larson, who was trying to figure out how do kids become self-motivated adolescents and adults, and he, and he said it wasn't through dutifully doing their homework. It was through the passionate pursuit of their pastimes. And this made sense to me in terms of my own life. I graduated from high school <clears throat> with a 2.8 grade point average. And at that time, I only needed a 2.5 to get into the University of Washington. I, I still kind of kicked myself for wasting all that extra energy overachieving. But <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> but I, I was a passionate rock and roller. I was, I was a rock and roll band. And, I, and every night I tell myself, I'll, I'll go practice or I'll learn a song or I'll, I'll, I'll teach, teach myself some chord structure and I'll do it for half an hour and then I'll do some homework. And I, what I remember is every single night coming out of my music room two and a half hours later and having no idea what time it was, having been completely absorbed mentally in doing something where I was fully focused, it took high effort, high determination, 
but low, but low stress. And, and I, this, this is what Reed's talking about. It's, 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 that, it's that flow state where you're completely in the moment. You're completely engaged in something. It's a, it's a right match for your, your skill set. So it's not too hard to be really stressful. It's not too easy to be boring. But you, you're fully engaged. He said, this is the kind of state that, 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 that develops this self-motivation. And it made sense to me because I, when we learn, when the neuroscientists say that kids are sculpting their adult brain, adolescents are sculpting the adult brain. I figured through rock and roll, I sculpted a brain. That once I found something I, I wanted to study and do something professionally, I could go pedal to the metal. And I'm 68 years old, I can still go pedal to the metal. <laughs> I think, I think, they think. And, so, and, and I see a lot of kids who are, are particularly motivated for school, and if they're motivated for something, video games is an exception, we can talk about that a little bit later, but, but if they're motivated for something, whether it's dance or art or rock climbing, or something that requires starting at, at it's this skill level and getting better and better and better and better, completely absorbed, that I, I say, I don't worry about you, because I know you're sculpting a brain that's going to be able to go pedal to the metal. And so this, this and it's just one way that when you have a very strong sense of control when you're in that flow state. Do you think everyone got, anyone ever got in flow state from doing worksheets? <laughs> yeah, it's rare. I think rare. But, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so th that's basically the rationale for why we wrote this book. And let's talk a little bit now about the stuff that, that's in it that we suggest to parents and, 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 educa and educators, too, uh, for helping kids develop a healthy sense of control. And the first thing um, came out in part of uh, some of my experiences um, when I, I used to do a lot of psychotherapy as, as well as neuropsychological testing the first part of my career. And you know, just by, by the way, 34 years ago, I, I tested this, uh, the child of a humorist who said, we really shouldn't call it raising children. We should call it lowering parents. Because it's hard. It's humbling, you know? It's never been easy. Uh, but the, the, I had experiences like this. I, 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 I do therapy, I sit down to do therapy with a 35-year-old. And I'd say, how can I help? And the person would say, I feel like I've spent the first 35 years of my life trying to live up to other people's expectations. Now I'm trying to figure out what's important to me. I had experiences that where I, I saw so many, I, I see so many underachievers. And I, I, so I, I, I see an underachiever and, and, and I'd ask him, if you, if you don't turn in an assignment, who's most upset? And invariably, my mom. And I'd say, who's next most upset? He'd say, my dad. Who's next most upset? My teacher. Who's next, who's next most? My therapist, my tutor. The kids never on the list. And I thought, there's something, there's something wrong with that picture. So many families over the, over the years have said, I dread dinner time, because after dinner, it's two and a half hours of World War III fighting about a kid's homework. And in 1986, I, I, I did some research on homework, and I learned for the first time that at, at that time, after 60 years of research, no one had demonstrated that homework contributed to learning. And after 90 years, in, in elementary school, and in 90 years, it's still the same thing. And I say, what is all this fighting for? Homework doesn't seem to contribute to learning. If it's not necessary. What's all this stress and fighting for? So I wrote an article that got reprinted in McCall's Magazine, of all places, on not fighting with your kid about homework. And what I suggested is, is that the parents tell their kids, I love you too much to fight with you about your homework. This is, this is the title of the second chapter of our book. I love you too much to fight with you about your homework. And the idea is you say, I'm not going to fight. You know, you're the most precious thing in the universe to me. Why would I want to fight with you about this? And also, I'm willing to do anything I can to help you. I'm willing to, 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 to sit with you. I'm willing to be your homework consultant. I'm willing to spend 6.30 7.30 every night helping you with this stuff. If you need a tutor, I'll try to get you a tutor. But I'm not willing to fight with you. I'm not willing to chase you around the house to try to get it. I'm not willing to, to, to act like, like somehow I'm supposed to be able to make you do your work or do it at a certain level. And when parents do this, it's transforming. It's transforming. One family recently said that the, the temperature in our household after dinner went down 30 degrees. And, and what, but what we care about, we care much less about whether a kid turns his assignment than whether a kid develops a healthy sense of who's responsible for what. And what, what I see in a lot of kids is that 80, adults spend 80 units of energy trying to help a kid do well, and the kid will spend 20. If the adults get more anxious, go up to 90, the kid will spend 10. And it doesn't change until the energy changes. Now, <laughs> one of my clients was reading our book after it came out and sent me an email and said, said, just this afternoon, I told my eighth grade boy, I love you too much to fight with you about your homework. And first he smiled, and then he hugged me, and then he said, is something wrong with you, mom? 
<laughs> apparently it's a little different than the, 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 the usual discourse at night. Um, so part of this, this idea, what, what we suggest is you think about yourself as a consultant, especially as your kids get older, more of as a consultant to your kid than as their boss or their manager or the person who always knows what's right and tells them what's to do, um, in part because this, this is what develops. This is how, partly how you develop this sense of control in kids. And so part of it is, is that, that we, we suggest we, we offer help and not try to force it on a kid. We offer advice and, 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 and not try to force it. One of the things that Ned and I say to the kids all the time is, is rather than to bring up a problem, say, we well, should do this or that, they'd say, I got a suggestion, you want to hear it? We're just looking for buy-in. That, that I see a lot of kids who think they aren't very smart, that they're, they're negative about themselves for some reason. And I say, I'm not going to try to take that away from you. I don't think I could. But I see it really differently. Would you like to hear my point of view? I'm just, I'm just more, I'm, we're always looking for buy-in. So it, it's, it's offering help, not trying to force it. it it's offering advice and just, just suggesting, would you like to hear my angle? I got a point of view about this. And it's, I was given a lecture in, in uh, Upper State New York uh, a few months ago about the book, and I was talking about this, and somebody turned the office, to the audience and said, this has transformed my relationship with my daughter. My daughter, I got a 16-year-old daughter in, in boarding school, and we talk three times a week. And every, every time we talk, it turns into an argument because she brings up some problem, and I said, we should do this and this, this, this and this, and she fights back, and it turns into an argument. So, so a couple of weeks ago, she, she called, and she told me this problem, and I said, is there any way that I could help? She said it completely changed the energy of our conversation. And so we, we like this consultant idea. So it's, it's offering help, it's offering advice. And we want kids to solve their own problems with our support. But the way kids become resilient is that they deal with stressful situations themselves. Their brain, when, when that happens, when kids deal with a stressful situation, the prefrontal cortex activates. <coughs> and if they actually successful manage, successfully manage it, what happens is it conditions the prefrontal cortex every time something stressful happens to go into coping as opposed to getting real anxious or avoiding or, or freaking out or quitting. And so we want kids to solve their own problems. And even, I mean, I, I, since kids bring home some, some serious problems. I, one, one of, somebody, I, I, a tutor I, I trained years ago told me that the second grade girl who was, who was tutoring came home from school one day, is just in a real bad mood. <coughs> and the mom said, is honey, is something wrong? And the kid said, well, the teacher asked today, what's the biggest number in the world? And I said, 23,000. And the teacher said, well, what about 23,001? And, 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 and the girl says, I was so close. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you, you got a story about this consulting yeah. idea. That, and, and from a scientific level, one of, one of the great studies that was ever done on resilience um, was a guy named Steve Myers out in Colorado State. Um, and he had this neat experiment where he had rats. And they had them in this little cage, and their, their, their tail sort of hung out the back. And they put <coughs> electrodes on, the, on them, and they would shock them. And so this is super stressful. They, they feel like they're going to be, you know, be chased by a predator and about to be eaten. And so the cortisol just explodes, you know, the stress chemical cortisol just explodes into their brains. But what, what, uh, what Meyer did was put a little wheel in there. And if the rats were trained, if they, if they spun this wheel, that it would attenuate the shock, would make it less, less intense, and it would, and it would, it would go away. And so this is massive activation of their, again, their left frontal lobe, regulating the stress response, telling, okay, we have, we have something that we can do here. This is bad, but it's going to be okay. Now, after the rats have been trained that this is the magic wheel of safety, uh, Meyer then disconnected the wheel, but didn't really you know, send a memo down the line to the, to the rats, so they didn't know. Uh, and so then they were getting shocked again. They think that this wheel works, but it doesn't work any longer. But still, they went into coping mode and they were less stressed because it was the perception that there's something that I can do here. So if you take this idea of being a consultant, when we help our kids work through a difficult situation and end up on a, on a, on a, on a solid footing in a better place, it's remarkably important whether they feel like they have done this themselves or whether someone rescued them. Because if someone rescued them, that doesn't help them be more resilient. It actually makes them less because you basically pull them out of a state of high stress and they had very little to do with it. So it's a hard position because as parents, we often know what the solution is and we want to jump right in and make the stressor go away for the kid because it also makes it less stressful for us. But we're really missing that opportunity for kids to develop those coping skills and that resilience. Now, the story that Bill's asking about, I, uh, my son when he was in fifth grade, 
I was in the middle of doing some kind of homework, something, something. And my wife, who's a very serious academic, was helping him with whatever it was really in fifth grade that needed that high-level academic skill. Uh, uh, but something, something had gone awry. Something had not been handed in, something had not been done, the details of which I can't recall. Um, but my wife sort of turned to my son and said, well, why didn't you do it, hand it in, whatever? And he said, one of these, because you didn't remind me. And I'm like, oh, geez, okay. So I'm, you know, like time out like this in the middle of the basketball game. And I look and like, okay, first of all, pal, in case your mom and I have not been clear enough, this is your work, okay? This is your responsibility. You deserve the right to do fifth grade in part because we've already done it and we don't need to do it again. And then, I, and, and, and we don't throw the mother under the bus in case you're not clear. That's just bad manners and, and really ill-advised. That will come back to bite you in ways you can't even begin to imagine. And then I looked at my wife and said, sweetheart, you, you can understand why he thinks that you're going to remind him. Because you always have, right? Now, my wife is a very academic person. She's frankly probably like a lot of people in this, in this room, um, really the, the female half of things. And, and what I mean by, is this. In my experience, most households are run by moms. Because running a household is like running a small, depending on how many kids you have, a medium-sized corporation, right? It takes unbelievable executive function skills, organizational, logistical wherewithal to make, to keep the wheels on the bus and things running smoothly. It's been a long time since my wife had the brain, you know, of a teenage boy, right? So he doesn't have those, and certainly in, in fifth grade, did not have those skills yet. But just because she had those in abundance, I mean, she could handle her schedule, my schedule, my son's schedule, my daughter's schedule, Bill's schedule, Lonnie if she wants the help. Everyone, I, mean, she's, I mean, she's really good at this stuff. But just because she should, because she could rather, doesn't mean that she should. He needed the opportunity to try this, right? And, if, I, mean, I, and I understand that this gets harder as you get, as you get older, as your kids get older and you, get, you know, go from middle school into high school. But goodness, you want to do it now. You want to let them do this with your help and with your support but let them do it for themselves. Because trust me, once you send them off to college, your ability to help or even get their attention is really, really low. I mean, the number of kids that I work with who are seniors in high school, who, so are we meeting next week at uh, four o'clock again next Thursday? I don't know, ask my mom. So think about this. This is a kid who's 17, sometimes 18, and is in six, eight, seven months away from going off to college, far away from any parental maternal help with like, 40, 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars worth of his parents' cash in his pocket, and they have no idea whether he can eat. That's an imperfect model. <laughs> now, I will say that being a consultant, for me, you know, this is the, very much the posture that I take, certainly with all the students with whom I work, because I have no stick. There is no taking their cell phone. There's no grounding. I got, I got nothing, right? So I'm all trying to get, get buy-in, as Bill would say, buy-in from kids to move in the directions of ways that I think will benefit them. But even with my own kids, it is so much less stressful to think of yourself as a consultant rather than a manager. Because if you think you're responsible for this kid who wants to do what he wants to do, ooh, that's a hard place to be. Now, I'm happy to report that now my son is a junior in high school. Uh, he's doing beautifully. His rehab counselor said he's been clean for three months. <laughs> um, but we had this, actually, my wife and I had this really neat exper uh, experience about a year ago. Um, when he was a sophomore, he got invited to, um, there was a, the big school dance, uh, homecoming dance, and he got invited to the party after the dance. Now, my son, like his dad, is a little geeky, uh, but he's cool and a cool kind of geek, right? Um, <laughs> like his dad, I'm sure. Um, but he, we were out for a walk, and he said, he said, Dad, I got a question. Yeah, pal, what's your question? So I'm going to that party uh, after the dance? Yeah, yeah, uh, do, do you need a ride? No, no, I'm, I'm good. Well, I'll go home with, with Samuel. Um, what do we do if we're at the party and people are drinking alcohol? Ooh, that's a good question. Now, inside, I'm going, like, I have nailed this parenting thing, right? Because my, my kid's ask, actually asking me that question. <laughs> So excited, right? So excited. Because these are the conversations that you've spent years rehearsing, right? And you think, you go like, what's the advice that you want to give? And I am 100% confident that if my wife and I had been riding his tail, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth grade about homework, he's not going to, I'm not going to talk to dad about this kind of stuff. We build these relationships early, and we're in a consultative 
consultative mode because he's going to go off to college and he's going to deal with, with, with issues that really are way more important than homework. And I want to have a posture, I want to have a relationship with my kid where he doesn't run away from me, he runs to me when he has issues that are, that are challenging. And I want him to go off in college, occasionally raise his hand and ask for help, but not go off to college feeling like he's helpless without me. I have a friend, I won't say who in case this ever goes out in public, uh, who when was being dropped off at college by her mom, her mom in her own sort of fit of anxiety said to this friend, I just don't know how you're going to make it through college without me. <laughs> Ouch. If, you're not, if you have a kid who's going off to college, you have time, so you can think about Don't use those words, right? There are probably some better ones to yeah. use. <laughs> Which, is, which kind of brings up um, the, th the third chapter in our book, and we, I, I promise we aren't going to go through all 14 chapters, but the, uh, the, the third chapter, it's, it's called It's Your Call, and it's about the wisdom of encouraging kids to make decisions for themselves and requiring adolescents to make important decisions about their own life. And I tell the story, I won't go into it now, but, it, but early in my career, um, I, I, I was working with very young kids who uh, were, it was advised that they repeat a grade. And the long story is, is that I started suggesting to, to, to tell kids, nobody's going to make you repeat the grade. It's going to be your call. But I want you to think through the pros and cons. And what I saw is that even seven-year-olds, if you help them think through the pros and cons, you help them th think about what's right for them, could make very good decisions for themselves. And so in the course of my, my, my work with kids, I've really supported this idea of, of in, in many, parent, many parenting experts say, don't, don't do things for kids that they're able to do for themselves. And my feeling is, let's not make decisions for kids that they can make with our help, that they can make for themselves. And so we, we have a big emphasis in this chapter on, on little kids, on giving them choices, and, and where we treat them respectfully, like they have a brain in their head. And, and I, we, th we, we say that, that the best message you can give an adolescent, <coughs> besides, I'm crazy about you, we're just basically communicating unconditional love. The best message you can give an adolescent is I have confidence in your ability to make, this, make decisions about your own life and to learn from your mistakes. And I want you to have tons of practice doing it before I send you off to college. And it, it turns out that the, the cognitive functions for decision making are really pretty much mature, mature by the time a kid is 14 or 15. And it also turns out that we, we used to think that the best decisions are we make them purely rationally. And it turns out that just that's completely untrue because if, if you have damage to emotional centers of your brain, you can't decide what to have for breakfast. And you, you can't make, decisions are rooted in emotions. And they're rooted in your emotions. And so we want kids to have practice thinking about what, what do I want? What's important to me? What will, what will happen to me if, if, if I make this choice or this challenge? How would it affect my friends? How would it affect my family if I do this or that? We want them to make, be paying attention to this kind of stuff. And what, what we found, we, 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 very consistently, is that we, we say, I, I want you to make this decision. I trust you to make this decision. Kids are ruthlessly honest with themselves about what they need, about what's right. They ask for help. And so our, our, what we say in the book is we want kids to make informed decisions. In other words, that we help them think through the pros and cons. We educate them, or ask them to tell other, talk to experts about it so they make a good decision. And that we go with the kid's decision unless they're crazy, meaning that, that <coughs> virtually everybody would say that that's a bad idea. And so uh, <coughs> do you want to talk a little bit about Anything you want? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yes, a glass of water. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, one of the things about this decision, this idea of saying it's your call, if you go back to the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala, is that when the amygdala fires, when, when, when the, if you lean on a kid really hard, he feels like you're, he's going to be forced to do something that he doesn't want to do, the stress response will go off and the, the executive functions go bye bye. So you're, you've primed a kid by being a little bit too intense, and then you're trying to deliver what you think is the most hard-won wisdom that you have to share. But by coming into intense, those prefrontal cortex have gone bye-bye. And so this, this, this lesson of life that you're going to deliver up, you're talking to a kid who's, who's by definition irrational. He's not going to hear it, right? And so we've had the experience over and over, and we say, look, it's going to be your call, but I want to talk this through. It quiets that amygdala. Dad's not going to make me do this. Okay, well, what do you have to say about this? And you, you have such a much more 
meaningful, thoughtful conversation where your kid is actually going to hear what you have to say. Because otherwise they'll go, uh-huh, 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 and, uh -huh, uh -huh, and they'll do that just to make you stop being intense. But they're not actually hearing what you're having to say. Now, again, this feels easier when kids are younger, harder as they get older, right? But, you know, you know but yeah, that was all, that's good when it's little kids and what, what do they have for breakfast or what, what game do they play? But, but seriously, this is high school. I mean, this is way too important to let this kid make this decision. Well, I can see why you think that, but think about that from a teen's perspective. My parents have always trusted me to make decisions, but now that it's something that's important, now that it's something really important about my life, I'm not the expert on me. It's not what we're trying to say, but it's, what, it's really easy for kids to hear this. I had a student who was working a bunch of years ago. The kid was doing um, a school year abroad. Uh, and the parents came in, they were trying to figure out this whole plan for test prep and all this jazz um, before she went off to Spain for the year. Uh, and and they, they were great parents, there was a lovely kid, but as it went on and on and on, the kid just got like more and more, you could just see it in her body, she was getting more and more and more tight. And I'm watching, 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 we sort of had this plan and we kind of bid them farewell and she came back a week or so later and I said, I just want to take a moment and ask. So, you know, we kind of ended up with a plan, your parents, you, you and I, um, but I, I just wanted to make sure that you're comfortable with this plan. Well, what do you mean? You didn't seem as happy at the end as you did at the beginning. I wonder if there's something that, that, that they said or that I said that you just weren't so comfortable with. And she said, no, the plan's fine. The plan, it, I mean, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. It's just the we. The, the we, what, what do you mean? We have to make sure we get our grades up in junior year. We have to make sure we do well in the SAT. We have to write the college essay. Good God, there's no we. I have to do this stuff. And it drives me nuts that they act like it's their life and not mine. That was a little hot, right? And you can see how she feels that way. Now, to be fair to her parents, this was this lovely child. I mean, she was just a great kid. <coughs> and they were taking their, their pride and joy as their oldest child, and they're sending her off to Spain for a year, where at best, in the middle of a crisis, they're at least 14 hours away for getting there. So I can understand how they were stressed, and they wanted to make sure that they had the perfect plan. And they're, I think in their views, trying to wrap their arms around and say, hey, we're all in this together. But she felt a little differently about that. Um, now, part of giving kids sort of more autonomy is that it feels better for them. They are more motivated and they're less stressed. But it can feel a little bit like a zero-sum game, that giving your kid more autonomy is a little bit less for you, right? My son is 16 years old now and he's learning to drive. <laughs> Has anyone gone through this experience? <laughs> uh, it's amazing how different the perspective of being a passenger with your 16-year-old is than being a driver when you're 16. You know, it's about two and a half feet away, but literally miles away, right? I mean, the perspective is so different. But if we want to give our kids more autonomy and we want to play this consultative, consultative role, the next thing is, is this idea of what we describe as being a non-anxious presence. Now, as Bill would say, we wish that we made this term up. We, we borrowed this from a guy named Edwin Freeman, who's a rabbi and a consultant, worked with corporations and families and all this sort of thing. And he made the point, it works, things work best, systems work best, when the pe person or people who are in charge are not overly anxious or emotionally reactive. If you're driving down the car, you know, my, have, do you ever have someone do that in the car with you? It's not, it's not, it's in, my wife does that with me because I drive, I say assertively, I don't think aggressive, I say assertively, right? But being a non-anxious presence is enormously helpful because, here's the fun part, stress is contagious. Stress is contagious. We've all had the experience of sitting down in an airplane or a car, whatever, and someone who comes in who's just seething. And your amygdala, your stress response, will react accordingly. It doesn't explain it, it only responds to stress. So teenagers, by the way, become incredibly attuned to emotion. They pick it up like this. The problem is, they're not great at explaining it. So particularly if you have a kid who's anxious, and if you are upset or angry or frustrated anywhere near them, they will typically think that you're upset or angry or frustrated at them. So there's a real value to being a non-anxious presence. Um, if stress is contagious, one of the things you can do is help by being less stressed yourself. Real quick thing though, as well, you can't, you can't actually fake being a non-anxious presence in case some of you are wondering about that. Uh, you can't. Um, there are these things called mirror neurons, um, sort of front of the prefrontal lobe. 
And if, if you're talking with someone, particularly someone who, who, whose face you know their territory really well, your mirror neurons will sort of dance in response to theirs, and, it, and it's kind of how we intuit what other people are feeling. So if your kid comes home, you know, and, and got some lousy grade that has you even more upset than they are, and you're like, don't worry, sweetheart, it'll be fine, right? Does your kid believe what you said or believe what she feels, right? It's, it's, kind, of a, it's kind of a big deal. Now, one of the researchers we look at who has a really great treatment on this uh, is a guy named uh, Michael Meany, who did this clever experiment with rat pups, where from the day that they were born, whisked them away, separated them from mom, and kind of, you know, sat there and handled them for about, you know, 30 minutes or so, stressed the poor little things out, get their cortisol exploding through their heads, and then after that, gave them back to mom. Now, if mom was what they described as a high-licking and grooming rat, which means basically nurturing, so they're there, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, and just sort of kind of snuggled with them, for about a half an hour. All that stress just flows right out of the brain. And what Meany did was is back and forth from really high stress to total recovery, high stress to total recovery. And as these rats, as their brains developed, they became what Meany and his colleagues described as California laid back rats. <laughs> they were impossible to stress because they'd had this experience of when things were bad, it was all gonna be okay because that had been the sum total of their experience. And the key to this was not this mom got a bunch of other mom rats and they went in there and you know, had a SWAT team of rats who extricated their child from danger, right? Or hired some you know, neuropsychologist or te test prep guy to go save the, you know. There was none of that. All that mom did was say, there, 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 there. How can I make it okay? And, and all they did is nurture. And so it's a little counterintuitive, I think, when our kids come home and they're upset about a grade that didn't go well or they got cut from the soccer team or a boyfriend or girlfriend and all that kind of jazz, and they're really upset. That for it, it's not intuitive that we help them more by, instead of responding in kind, to say, how can I help? And the challenge, of course, is that all of our fears as parents are about the future. We feel if our kid is, not, if our kid is suffering now, if our kid is stuck now, that he's going to be like that forever. And I will tell you that one of the most helpful things you can do is take the long view. Bill and I both have the advantage of having worked with a whole lot of kids for an awfully long while. And we've seen kids who were just a mess when they were 6 or 12 or 16 or 20 or 22, who years later are just fantastic. And so there are enough people in this room that there's someone, either as a family, as a mom or a dad or as a kid, where things are not going as you would like them. And I'm sorry for that, and I'm sympathetic to that. But it can be really helpful to take the long view. I'll, I'll overshare a little bit. Uh, I had a, a father who's an alcoholic who eventually drank himself to death. Uh, and my mother uh, was mentally ill because of the stress on her. So I spent about three months of seventh grade in a pediatric psychiatric hospital. Uh, not the cool place to be in seventh grade, in case you're wondering. Uh, a, a little tough. Um, and it was, you know, it, was, it was a really hard time for me. Um, but one of the things that was helpful, um, I'll couple this with take the long view, but also if you don't know what else to do, make it your highest priority. To be a non-anxious presence, the easiest way to do that, if it's hard to take the long view, the easiest way to do that is make it your top priority. Just enjoy your kid for where he is. Sorry, I get teary when I think about this in my family. For where he is, for where she is. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a much easier lift. Because I remember when I went back I had been this top, top student, this top in everything. School was easy for me until my whole world fell apart. So when I came back from seventh grade like a bad John Hughes movie, you know, I was really apprehensive in part because I thought that my teachers liked me because I was so good at giving them top work. And I was terrified that I was going to come back and they'd be like, Mr. Johnson, so where are the last three months of homework? I mean, I was terrified. I mean, it wasn't a rational thought, but what did I know? Because I was, you know, 13 at the time. And I walked in the door of Ms. Greenberg, my, uh, my math teacher, who was my favorite person. And I opened the door, and I sort of poked my head in it. And I, I, don't know what's gonna, I don't know what I thought was gonna be lobbed in my head. And she looks up from her desk, and she smiles as wide as a person can smile. And she says, Ned, how are you? And it had never occurred to me that my teachers could like me for me, not because I gave them A's. And if you go back to that point that teenagers are really good at picking up our concerns, our emotions, but they're terrible at explaining why. And so if your kid comes home with a grade that's not so hot or something that went really sideways, and you're concerned for them, you really are because you want them to have everything. You want the world to be their oyster. 
But if you're not, if you don't do it quite right, you're, it's easy for kids to think that you're so disappointed in them, not disappointed for them. So for all the concerns you have, and again, I'm a test prep guy, I'm thinking about people going to college and all that kind of jazz. One of the highest things you can do in being this non-anxious presence is just constantly remind yourself to love your kids. You remember when we all had babies, right? You'd have you know, like a six month old and you just sort of sit there and you just like, oh, my God, those ears. And you could, I mean, apart from the fact that you had to go to sleep, right? You would just sit there and beam at this thing for hours on end on end. I mean, can you remember this feeling, right? And, and think about what that feels like if you're the, on the receiving end of that. And even at this age when you have kids and you just sit there and go, gosh, you're just, you're, you're just a great kid. At a neurological level, it has a profound effect. Yeah. You know, one of my colleagues um, a few years ago said that it's really great when home is a safe base. You know, when, when home, this life is stressful enough, and, and, and when, when kids come home and it feels safe and not particularly stressed or, or anxious. So, uh, one of my favorite cartoons reflect, is, is about a situation that is not like that, where these two teenager boys are walking. And one says to the other one, I'm just so sick of my dad. He's constantly on my back about my grades. He's constantly saying, get those grades up. Last night I couldn't take it anymore. I said, get that salary up. <laughs> so we'll, 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 we'll just take seven or eight minutes and just talk about a couple of the chapters later in the book. There's two chapters in the book um, that are about what we call radical downtime. And the idea is that 20, 30 years ago, you, you, you could play ping pong or watch TV as downtime. And the idea is, is that life is so stressful now and it's so fast paced and kids are so connected 24 seven technologically that they have very little time to kind of reflect on themselves, very little time to quiet time. The, 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 the balance between rest and activity is way out of whack in the favor of activity. And so what we're suggesting is, is basically three kinds of what we call radical downtime, meaning when it appears that you're doing nothing, but actually what you're doing is incredibly helpful, healthy, restoring, refreshing of your brain. And the three things, the first is mind wandering or daydreaming. There's a lot of concern that kids have so little time now to reflect on themselves, so little time to be bored, that there's all this evidence that you, mind wandering, daydreaming is highly related to problem solving, to creativity. In young people, it's highly related to the development of a coherent sense of self, a coherent identity. Because to understand who you are, you've got to think about your life, and you have to reflect on yourself. And it's also uh, related to a, a sense of empathy, to, 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 to understand other people. You have to be able to think about it. And so we want, we want kids to have unplugged time where they simply have time, especially when they're younger, to play and be in their own heads. When they're older, not to be constantly having earphones in their head or be in front of a screen, so that they have time to, to reflect in themselves. And it turns out there's a part of the brain, there's, there's a brain network in the brain called the default mode network that only activates when you aren't focused on a task. And virtually every mental health condition is, 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 is <coughs> reflected in part by an inefficient default mode. So the idea is when you're focused on a task, you want to be focused. And, and then you, you, if you go into daydreaming, you want to be able to snap right back. But kids who have ADHD, autism, depression, anxiety disorders, that, that, that they don't toggle back and forth as efficiently. And people are thinking they just don't have enough time spending in that default mode, in that, that self-reflective um, kind of state. So there's, there's, there's part in the book about, discussion in the book about daydreaming. We're, we're big fans of meditation. And our experience is that when kids learn to meditate, it, and they do it, they, they experience the same benefits as adults. And I, I've been practicing Transcendental Meditation for 44 years, and has been doing it for seven or eight years. We're huge fans. So, so many of my clients, I, had, I saw a kid a few years ago, sixth grade, he, I, I met with this, he and his therapist. To, I was supposed to kind of remind him how, how bright and competent he was, because he was really down on himself, really depressed. And he spent the whole hour with this crying basically, because he felt he disappointed his parents and his teachers. And, and at the end of the session, the mom said, what else can I do? He's got the best therapist in the whole DC area. He's on medication. I said, well, you could think about having him learn in TM, Transcendental Meditation. I, I think it would help him if he actually did it. And about nine months later, I called the family, and I, and I can't remember why I called them. But I said, how's he doing? How's, how's seventh grade going? 
She says, God, he's having a great year. He's doing well in school. He's really involved in sports. He's in a good mood. And I said, do you ever learn to meditate? And she said, oh my God, yeah, he's been doing it every day, twice a day. I said, oh my God, I wonder if that's why. And it, 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 it just works. I've, so I've had a lot of experience with my clients. I, I've been involved in these school programs that are getting uh, kids meditating in schools, very powerful results. I did a couple studies on uh, middle school students practicing TM um, with, with ADHD, and we got really good results. And this, the first study, we interviewed the kids after the study, and they all said, I'm much less anxious, much less stressed. Most of them said, I'm better organized, I can do my homework more independently. And this one kid who was wildly impulsive said, before I started meditating, if I, if I was walking in the hall and somebody stopped and bumped me, I'd just turn around and hit him. But now if I'm, I've been meditating for three months, if I'm walking in the hall and somebody bumps me, I stop and think, should I hit him or not? You know, <laughs> it reflects a tremendous progress. Yeah, I'll just tell you quickly, there's a, kid, there's a kid in the control group who actually left the school, so he didn't, never learned to meditate until he was 19. But he, he was, his impulsivity manifested as talking real loud. And apparently he, he, he uh, saw a therapist who was, was renting space from a psychologist who didn't work with kids and apparently didn't like kids. And he goes to the, this, this therapist's office the first time, and he's talking real loud in the waiting room. And the psychologist comes out and says, when you come here, son, you're, you're going to have to be quiet. And the kid said, if I could be quiet, I wouldn't have to be here. <laughs> in any case, uh, and the third, the third aspect of this radical downtime, it's daydreaming, it's meditation, where you're apparently doing nothing, but what you're doing is incredibly powerful in your brain, is sleep. And sleep may be the best, most important thing for a developing brain, and Ned and I spend endless hours talking with kids about it. Oh, goodness, the amount of money I've gotten paid to tell kids about <laughs> sleep. I mean, really, because when I first started doing test prep and understanding and anxiety and, and how you know, a little bit less anxiety would increase in performance, the first thing that I stumbled onto was sleep. And it's helpful to know that sleep has the same kind of impact on the brain as does, as does anxiety. It makes your amygdala about 60% more reactive because it, it weakens the, if you're really tired, the, the connection between your prefrontal cortex and your amygdala is impaired. And you're going to jack up more cortisol. Robert Stickgold describes sleep deprivation as creating a negativity bomb. When they teach people vocabulary words, they'll, they'll absolutely focus in on and memorize all the words that are negative and, and kind of not pay attention to things that are positive. Um, it has the same kind of impact uh, effects as ADHD. I was working with this kid who was really, really bright with some, some executive function weaknesses, and I was explaining that you're going to have an easier time staying on top of your stuff when you're more well-rested than when you're less, less well-rested, and then remind him about the negative negativity piece. And I said, have you, for instance, ever noticed that when you're more tired, you feel like your mom is you know, sort of even more annoying than normal? And he sits there, he's a really funny kid, he sits there and goes, my God, I must be tired all the time. <laughs> She hit it, I mean, she, which, she, which she deserved, right? But, but one of the things about sleep, of course, is that, you know, if I'm more tired, I'm going to react to other people around me. But also, if I'm more tired, I'm going to affect other people around me. So even if you've got a kid who's really anxious, if you yourself are more arrested, it's going, it's going to have a positive impact on that person. So in a perfect world, all of us are collectively well rested, but you can sort of inoculate a kid. One person is not getting enough, but the other people around them are getting enough sleep. Um, because, again, I'm sort of tasked with having kids perform well on tests, I'm always looking for anything that kind of disrupts it. And I will typically have a student come in and, and have done practice sections at home and run really sideways. Um, and I know why, but the question is always, well, so tell me, when did you, did you, I mean, did you time this at home? Were you distracted? No, it was fine. No one, no one was bothering you. Your mom wasn't asking you to, to, to clean it. No, no, no. I know she, no one was home. It was just me. Oh, you just, you at home? So how did you time yourself? I mean, did you, did you, did you use a kitchen timer? You use your cell phone? Your children have no idea what a kitchen timer is, by the way. They have no <laughs> idea. And they're like, well, I use my cell phone. But I wasn't looking at it. Oh, I'm, I'm sure. No, you're way more responsible than that. Um, but, but quick question. Did you get any texts when it go off? Yeah, but I didn't really look at them. So there's this great study that's in our book. Uh, Michigan State University did this thing where they found that a 2.8 second interruption doubled people's error rates when they work on a computer. And that's basically the time of ping. You don't have to actually do anything with it. And it would double people's error rates. And they're like, oh my gosh. I'm like, yeah, I know. It just completely ruins your relationship with your phone. Oh, and by the way, since we're on the topic, when you go to bed at night, where does your cell phone sleep? What, what do you mean? Allow me to rephrase. When you go to sleep, where is your phone? In my room, why do you ask? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. 
So then I go in my stump speech about how, how detrimental that is, how it messes with our attention, how it messes with our sleep. And then, you, as you can imagine, because teenagers are, 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 are both um, sure, sure about themselves and, and occasionally desperate, the Hail Mary of a desperate teenager is, but myself, I, but, uh, but I use it for my alarm clock. <laughs> to which one can only respond, if we were really being honest with ourselves, we would admit we use our mother for our alarm clocks, wouldn't we? <laughs> and so, uh, but really, and, and no one can, but alarm clock, I mean, you know, you go to these, these a lot more where I am, a lot of these um, kind of beautiful but expensive independent schools, um, and so they're paying whatever they're paying for that and, and way too much for me, and, and, and whatever cell phone costs these days, iPhone costs these days, and you're telling me that nobody in your life can come up with 20 bucks for like a standalone proper alarm clock? Really? Including your Nana? I don't believe it. So by the way, I have, <coughs> I have Amazon Prime. So uh, what's your favorite color? What? W b blue, why do you ask? Because oh, I'm going to buy you an alarm clock. And every week I buy an alarm clock and then the little session report that goes home. So I got Mike an alarm clock. His cell phone should park in the kitchen. And, they, and then that's the end of our relationship working together. <laughs> And the, the last two chapters in our book are, um, uh, are, we wrote them in part to, to correct the, help correct what we consider to be the delusional view that, that many teenagers grow up and many kids grow up in, in terms of how you become successful in this world. And that certainly where we live, I mean, I, I was given a lecture to a, a, an AP 11th grade English class uh, a couple years ago and really high achieving kids and, and was, they wanted me to talk about stress and sleep deprivation so I did and, and the teacher at the end of the lecture came up to me and said these kids all think it's either Yale or McDonald's. <laughs> I was talking with, with, with I met with the, the faculty a few years ago at Sidwell Friends School, a really prestigious school in, in DC and one of the ninth grade teachers th said these kids are all terrified by the time they're in ninth grade that they aren't going to get into a prestigious enough college. And it turns out you know, th that all this research suggests that it really doesn't make that much difference where you go to college in terms of how successful you are financially, career-wise, how happy you are with your, your personal life or your career life. And so we, we think it just, it, it'd be very useful to tell kids the truth, that there's advantages to going to elite schools, that doing well in schools are, is, is, has all kinds of advantages. However, it's not necessary. Because if the idea is that you've got to be in the top 10% of your class to be successful, it's pretty discouraging to 90% of the population, and it's simply untrue. And so we, talk, we have a chapter called, Who's Ready for College? that talks about the challenges of so many kids are experiencing now going into college with, all, with, the, with the mental health problems off the charts and trying to, try to be sure that kids have had plenty of experience running their own life before they go to college. And we, we also uh, talk about this idea that, uh, of what, what it takes to be successful. And in the, second, the last chapter is called Alternate Roots. And it's, about, it's, it's just the, the basically little biographies of people who became successful who either weren't top students or in some, some cases never went to college, who've crafted really beautiful, successful lives where they're contributing to this world. And what we find is when we, t we give kids an accurate model of reality, Meaning there's advantages to being a really good student, going to elite schools, but it's not necessary. It motivates everybody. It motivates the kids who really want to go to elite schools in a healthy way. It motivates the other kids to work hard because they, they figure, otherwise they figure, what's the point? And so, do you want to comment on this? And then, yeah, you know? well, part of it, um, Bill, when he mentioned at the beginning of that, that model of nuts, of novelty, unpredictability, threat to ego, and, and a low sense of control, the same person, Sonia Lupin, who, who, who put forth that idea, talks about how incredibly valuable one, one of the single best ways to decrease stress is to, is to have a plan B, no. is sort of plan B thinking. And so that's what, for us, is the idea of alternate routes. By all means, we would love everyone to be as educated as you possibly can be, because we're talking about maximizing human potential, both for an individual, for a family, but also for communities. It's a terrible thing if talent is, goes undeveloped. But, as Bill would say, when people feel like, only if I can be the top, 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 top can I be successful, it's chronically stressful. And for some kids, it's toxically stressful. I will say, from, from my work with test prep, um, there's a group called Fairtest, uh, website fairtest.org. If you've got a kid who's great in every possible way except for these ridiculous tests, go to Fairtest. 
It's a list of 1,100 plus colleges and universities that are test score optional, including you know, Bates, Bowdoin, uh, Wake Forest, GW, a place called University of Chicago. I hear that one's pretty good too, right? And you, know, you may want to go someplace warmer you know, than Chicago. I understand, I understand that. But, but the idea that, the idea that you know, I don't have to, my, I, my future is not limited by what I do on this test. I, with every kid I have who's overly stressed about this, I'll, I'll some t figure a way to kind of, kind of angle into that. And they have no idea. And rather than having kids, well, that's great. I'm out of here. I'll take the money. Thanks very much. Good to see you, pal. It never happens. But what it does is lower kids' stress. Because Bill would say, as a, as a, as a clinician, that a huge amount of, of effective therapy is, is really reframing thinking from, I have to, to I want to. Because I have to is threatening. And it's cortisol. And that's corrosive to brains. I want to is dopamine. And it's the chemical of approaching a, 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 a goal. And so this plan B thinking is just a way to let your kid know. I mean, if you, if you, who would go on a trapeze without a net, right? But if you know that I can stretch as far as I can, and if I, and I fall short, it's not, I'm not done. It's not over. Yeah. So we like, we like this a lot. I mean, again, I you know, go back to my sort of you know, checkered path, but, you know, Bill has up and down through, through his academics as well. And you know, the idea that you can try really hard. Can I just yes. make a yeah, comment yeah, yeah, about that? Yeah. Which is, I, I see a lot of discouraged kids, a lot, a lot of who aren't doing well and figure that, you know, that their, their whole life is uh, basically going to be uh, uh, a failure. And I tell them that the first time I went to graduate school, I was at the University of California at Berkeley in a PhD program in English, and I went 20 straight weeks without turning in a single assignment. And, and, and <laughs> when I work with underachievers now, I say, 20 weeks, I didn't turn in nothing. Top that. <laughs> I, I set the bar high. You know, but I, it, 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 was the, it was completely humiliating. I flunked out. It was completely humiliating to me. And, and I felt like my whole life had gone up in smoke. And when I, when I see discouraged kids, I tell them that. And then I tell them that a couple of weeks later, I got fired from a job in a typing pool. And, and, and because kids have this idea that successful people, it, it was just this a straight ascent. And we want kids to understand that, that, that this is a very forgiving country and, and that you can screw up and get back on the, the path you want. Oftentimes the path's not clear. And, and you, you, you basically you try things. If they don't go well, you try something else. You get to try a plan B. Yeah, but but yeah. This, this is what the last two chapters in the book are about. Yeah. And, and, and we end with a book with the observation that people know, um, often attributed to Maya Angelou, that, that, that the kids are going to forget, or people are going to forget most of what we tell them. And they're going to forget a whole lot of what we do for them. But what really gets wired into their brains is how we make them feel. And if we can keep that in mind, you know, for, for me, for us, what I think I want all kids to feel, obviously that they're loved. You know, there's nothing better than feeling like you're loved unconditionally. Sometimes it's this unconditional part that can be a little hard. But we also want kids to feel capable and trusted and supported. But this idea of a sense of control is really about feeling capable, that they may have all the support in the world, but we want them to feel like they have earned their successes and they've owned their bumps and bruises. Because ultimately, th that we're looking for developing brains that are resilient in the face of stress and that are intrinsically motivated. Because if I could, but I could tell everyone here that nothing profoundly challenging or bad will happen to any of you or to any of your children, I would be the happiest person in the world. But we know that that's not the case, that there are all kinds of adversities, that we were not part of anyone's plan of illnesses and, and, and failures. And what we want fundamentally is for our kids to be able to weather that, to stand up, to dust themselves off and go, all right, Let's do it again. So we'd like to thank you guys for being here. Um, principally, we, we're really keen on people buying the book as much as you can. We've been paid really everything we can. For, we get about a, about a buck for every book, so this is not a money-making venture for us. And I'm serious about, about this because for us, some of the things we're asking people to do, it feels like stepping back a little bit and it feels a little bit like unilateral disarmament, right? If you're trying to step back from your kid a little bit and you feel like everyone else is pushing their kid ahead, you think, well, where does that, where does that get me? But, but th these issues are not ones that just this family or that family or this school. I mean, we're all over the country, and we see the same kind of challenges everywhere. And these are really systemic changes. So if we're going to, if there's systemic problems, 
If we're going to have systemic problems, we need systemic changes. And that really comes from folks like you working within your communities, working with your schools, so that we're, we're kind of singing from the same hymnal and trying to get everyone moving a little bit in a direction that's a little bit more healthy for children. Because I want my kids to be happy and healthy and successful. But I want the same thing for all of your children as well. So we really hope that you guys will read the book. We really hope that you put some of this into practice. We really hope that you reach out to us with suggestions because we like to think that we're all in this together to really try to move things in the right direction for everyone's kids. So thank you.